Welcome to the 2018 to 2019 NCFCA webinar series. Thank you for joining us for an exciting conversation with debate committee members, Ravi Paul and Christy Scheip. This webinar will be unique from our previous topic webinars as we will cover insights into the framework of team policy debate. The presentation time will identify possible strategies for approaching the resolution, common pitfalls and admonitions about the topic. Please keep this framework in mind as you craft your questions and take advantage of the fact that you have an opportunity to interact with NCFCA leadership who can provide insight into team policy debate. We are thrilled to have these two gifted debate coaches and committee members with us to discuss the TP topic and policy debate in general. Tonight's presentation should be used to spark conversation and thought among parents, coaches, and students and does not replace the rules. As a reminder, every round and competition will bring a unique set of circumstances that, if there is a question, will be addressed by the national adjudication team. So with that, I'm excited to tell you that the format for this evening's webinar will begin with a 45-minute interview-style conversation between Christy and Ravi, and will be followed by a brief break for a giveaway hosted by NCFCA. During this giveaway time, we will be giving away two hoodies to individuals who have submitted thoughtful questions, sparking great conversation during our Q&A session. So please do engage by submitting questions using the Q&A button that is available on your screen. We will have a live Q&A session during which Christy and Ravi will respond to some of the questions you have submitted throughout the presentation. And we look forward to engaging with you then. So as a final note, if you have any technical difficulties, you can submit requests for help in the chat section, which is separate from the Q&A option. And our webinar tech support team is on the back end and ready to help you in any way they can. So at this point, it is my honor to invite Ravi and Christy to join me on screen as I introduce them to you this evening. Our first NCFCA speaker for this webinar is Christy Scheip. Christy and her husband, Richard, have been married for 19 years and have five children. One of the Shipe children is currently competing in NCFCA. Christy was homeschooled through high school, graduated summa cum laude with a bachelor's in political science from Cedarville University in 1998 and received the Edmund Burke Award for Social Sciences. She participated on the Cedarville debate team for three years and is the author of two debate textbooks and producer of the companion video. She is an NCFCA parent, debate coach, and member of the debate committee, and we're thrilled to have her with us this evening. Joining her is Ravi Paul. Dr. Paul is an associate professor of management information systems in the College of Business at East Carolina University. He earned both his master's and PhD in industrial management from Clemson University after completing his bachelor's of science in mechanical engineering from Bangalore University. He is also an NCFCA parent, debate coach, and member of our NCFCA debate committee. And we are excited to have him share time with us this evening. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to you, Ravi and Christy. Thank you. Thanks, Natalia. Um, well, I'm excited about the topic tonight and I'm gonna have the chance to kind of interview Dr. Paul. Um, Ravi, I don't know how many years you've been involved in the league, but it's been quite some time. And I've enjoyed getting to know you, enjoyed to get, getting to know how you coach team policy debate. Um, you do it with integrity. Your students I've seen do an excellent job. And I think that you have a lot to share with our students, coaches, and parents this evening. So I'm excited about what we're going to talk about tonight. Thank you, Christy. Um, so why don't you start us off by sharing about the big picture of how team policy debate fits into the overall mission of NCFCA. Sure, yeah. Thank you, Christy. I, I, think, it's, um, <clears throat> I think it's an honor for me to be here sharing this with you. Um, as I was sharing a little bit before the, the program be, began, um, when we first started, um, just heard about NCFCA, I was, uh, very intrigued, especially by team policy debate, and I wanted my kids to uh, participate, but I had no earthly idea what it was, what it was about, and uh, or anything of that nature. 
And uh, the first resource we got our hands on was uh, your book. Right. Uh, and uh, and I'm, I'm really glad that I, um, that was the first resource that, uh, that, that came into um, my hands. Uh, and, and the little, uh, the DVD that you had uh, showcasing, you know, how to do debate the right way and how not to do it. And it was, it was fantastic. So I, I am uh, just, it's, it's a thrill to, um, to kind of be here and, and share um, this time with you. Um, uh, having said that, I, I need to uh, also say that you, um, uh, you've been working on that and you've uh, done at least a couple of major updates to um, that book. And, uh, and now, I, I mean, I have to say, um, it's a fantastic resource that we have now uh, under the NCFCA curriculum. So um, I just want to encourage folks that want to know, you know, what team policy debate is and how to do it right, how to do it with integrity, uh, why you do it, and what's different about doing it um, in the NCFCA versus some other leagues, all those kind of things, I, I would highly, 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 I don't think I could recommend it any higher um, than, uh, than just, just to say it's, it's a fantastic resource. And I hope uh, lots of folks uh, take advantage of that. So um, with that said, um, oh, uh, and also I want to point out um, at the outset, uh, that's, that's on the NCFCA website. Uh, but also we have some other uh, really good resources that I think everybody should be familiar with, uh, everybody that's participating, competing, um, you know, the, the, all the resources that are available, the, um, the sample cases that are sample case documents uh, and the additional support that, uh, that we've provided, um, the debate rules document. Uh, these are all documents that are very, very helpful and I, and I would strongly encourage everybody um, to get into those documents uh, quickly, early, and, and, and often to be completely familiar with them because um, I think that'll be very, very helpful as well uh, as you focus on the topic itself. Um, so one of the things, and, and to address your question, Christy, about um, you know, the, the big picture, one of the things I remember and I've always loved about uh, the NCFCA is its focus on helping students learn to debate with integrity as unto the Lord. Um, I, and I absolutely think that's where we should begin. That's where we um, should focus on that. And, and just the encouragement to, uh, I, I love this, and, I, and this is my um, um, admonition, encouragement to, to my kids and people I coach and talk to and stuff is focus on, focus on the learning, focus on the relationships. Don't focus on the, just the results or the awards. Uh, because as we discussed, and I thought you shared so well last week's webinar, those will fade away. They go away. They, it, it's just, um, they're, they're temporary. Of course, it feels good, but that's not the end goal here. Um, and speaking of in integrity, um, I'd like to start there. And I like to think of, as part of NCFCA um, team policy debate, of uh, three kind of levels of, of integrity. Um, so I would start with the top level, the most important level, is that we debate with um, Christian integrity. Um, and what I mean by that is that we debate and do all the things that we do in preparation as well as in the round with honor, with integrity, with gentleness, with respect as representatives of Christ. That's, that's our calling. That's our, um, that's our standard. Um, and always, always in, the, in our words, in our heart, we respect our opponents. Um, and I think team policy, uh, additionally, compared to LD, has the additional advantage of having to work with a partner. And so there are a lot more opportunities to learn how to do that with respect, how to listen to your partner, how to 
how to engage, uh, you know, challenge each other because we are talking about um, this is one of the best tools I know of helping iron sharpen iron uh, as an activity. And uh, but that can start even with your own partners. You do that uh, as partners and then that carries over into uh, the debate round. And, and obviously, you know, when we look at the NCFCA mission, um, you know, it's, it's very clear. I love the NCFCA mission. I think it's, it's just so good and it's laid out right there in probably the most important statement in NCFCA. Rather than pursuing competitive forensics as an end unto itself, NCFCA encourages students to pursue forensics as a means to learn the skills necessary to effectively communicate truth to the world. I love that part. I, I, you know, so, so it's very clear right off the bat, it's not about winning, it's not about becoming the greatest debater, uh, although I think we do have some fantastic debaters and they, and they go on, uh, do great things, um, but that's not the end goal. Um, and then um, if I can share 1 Peter 3.15, I'm sure everybody's familiar with it, um, but in your hearts revere Christ as Lord, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks to give the reason for the hope that is in you, but do this with gentleness and respect. Um, I want to sort of emphasize that last part. I think we may maybe tend to gloss over that and, and focus on the, the apologetics, the call to defend our faith and why we believe what we believe. But but it's a very important phrase that's added to that, which says, do this with gentleness and respect. And I think learning to do that as we debate and engage is excellent training for when we go out into the world and people do ask us or, or we have opportunities for uh, when they ask us to share the reason for the hope that we, that we have, the joy that we have the, as we're walking with the Lord. I, I think that's... Um, it's very helpful to be able to do that with gentleness and respect um, and not just to win points or, or, or things of that nature. So, so that's kind of, in my mind, the top, the top level. And then moving down, I think there's the, uh, we're called to a standard of intellectual integrity. Um, and what I mean by that, I think to me, that means um, pursuing excellence in everything that we do. Um, a lot of that happens before we even compete in our first round, debate round. Um, that's tied to uh, preparation before uh, in terms of doing the research and, and uh, the pursuing excellence there. Um, and, and in pursuing excellence in doing the work, um, actually doing the work and not trying to, you know, skim some stuff or... Um, those kind of things, Take, taking shortcuts, but just doing the work with excellence. Um, and of course, as we engage with our opponents, um, I think of that involves things like, um, I've always encouraged my kids to um, share with others, um, share arguments with others, ask them, you know, this is what I'm thinking, what do you think? How would you run arguments against this? You know, that's the iron sharpening iron. Um, um, share with others. I've had kids that will share a, a really good brief against their own case um, because they want to engage in a quality, fair debate round that, that's, uh, that's a lot. They enjoy that a lot. And I think that's a, another thing, just that uh, attitude of we're sort of in this together, even though we're engaging in this debate for this round. Uh, we're building each other. Um, and then finally, and unfortunately, this is kind of what we think about when we talk about integrity. Uh, I think it's the third level, and that is um, academic integrity, um, which deals with um, citing things properly, um, you know, giving credit where it's due to the, to the source, uh, not um, taking the source's ideas or thoughts or words out of context, um, not putting words in their mouth, those kind of things. So that, that's also very, very important. So I, I kind of think of this at the, at the high level, big picture level um, of being composed in the, in, into those three levels. That, that makes so much sense, Ravi. I like how you split it into those levels with hmm. the Christian character at the top. Hmm. And as you were talking, I just thought about the most valuable thing that my daughter 
Emma, who's my oldest, who's graduated from high school now and at, at college, mm -hmm. the most valuable thing that she learned was um, how to be, how to do that with gentleness and respect, how to debate with gentleness and respect. Mm -hmm. that was not her natural bent. <laughs> <laughs> And yeah. she got those comments all over the ballot every time you were too harsh. And so rather than focusing on winning, we were focusing on how to get that comment off the ballot, how to start treating people in such a way that you communicate, you care, and you respect them. And mm -hmm. that's by far the most valuable thing that she learned. So that's that's that awesome. really yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, can you share with us some core ideas of team policy debate, like a framework for understanding what it's all about? Yeah, sure. Um, so I think um, if, if I can sort of present a real world um, scenario um, and sort of tie in some of the, the core ideas in team policy debate. Um, so the I, sort of the idea is that we are um, we, as in the affirmative team, presents a plan. Uh, and the plan is to change something, reform something. And it's to reform something to make it better. And so the way we show how something is better is by showing that there are advantages tied to making the change in the plan. Um, so th the scenario that I kind of think of is, um, and I'll t try to tie in some of these core ideas as we do that, is this is, you're presenting a bill, the affirmative team is presenting a bill to Congress um, slash the president. <clears throat> and when we do that, the, the bill is, is the plan. So the, we're talking about some kind of change in policy, right? That, that's, that's what the bill is. And so in order to show that it's changing something or solving something, we have to show that there is a problem in the status quo. So there's some harm, something that's not quite good enough in the status quo and that the problem exists, right? So there, there is a problem. It's a significant problem because we, we don't really want to spend a lot of time uh, working on something that may not be that significant. So the problem is significant, the harms are significant um, in the status quo. And we're saying, here's a bill that we're proposing that we are presenting to Congress and ultimately for the president to sign into law that will result in, if it's passed and signed, it will result in these advantages. So that's kind of the burden that the affirmative team is, is presenting um, in, the, in this case. Uh, so some of the other ideas that come up with it is one of the things that is the plan is really the, the, the core, the most important part of the affirmative case, uh, because that's what they're presenting as what's going to be signed um, into law. Um, and so part of that is um, one, of, one of the ways that I, I understand this, and you can certainly uh, add or, or uh, correct me there, Christy, but mm -hmm. the idea is if we did not um, have this concept called fiat, the fiat basically says that if you, if the, in, the, in our scenario, if the judges vote for the affirmative team for the plan, mm -hmm. we are going to assume that the president of the United States will sign it into law. Right. And, and, the, and the reason that is important, I think, partially, um, is if not, we could spend a lot of time in the debate round just talking about, well, no, he won't sign it because he's Republican. Or he won't, you know, all these kind of things which are really not very uh, applicable to the debate topic uh, and, and really kind of goes off um, on, on tangents that are not very useful. So by by saying, yes, we, we, we are going to assume that the president will sign this into law, you take those um, sort of things out of the equation and allows you to focus around on substantial arguments that, that deal with 
you know, is this a good plan? How is it a good plan? What, what are some potential side effects or disadvantages that might come about? Those kind of things, which are uh, the really um, important part of learning how to do team policy debate. Um, so, um, and one of the other issues that I think that's come in and, and you think about the bill, well, there's always people who are considered supporters of the bill and, or, or we call them advocates or advocacy for the case, for the plan. Well, you want that because you want people that have thought through this, that have spent time thinking about the problem and um, doing research into whether this plan will actually help solve the problem and those kind of things. So advocacy, I think, is important to provide, um, it, it's really sort of supporting your plan in the sense of it's coming from experts and people who, who have spent a lot of time thinking about it. And, and because they are in support or they advocate this, we are saying that it's a good idea, that it's a good plan as well. Um, so apart from those kind of terms and core ideas, uh, to me, and, and you talked about this last week, um, you know, you referred to debate being, it's, it's about the clash, it's about the engagement. Um, yeah. and, and I think uh, it, that aspect is, is easier in team policy debate, it's some, it's somewhat uh, compared to the Lincoln-Douglas world. Um, I think of, but I mean, it doesn't mean that it's not, I think that's, that's a great way to look at it because if, it, if you're not engaging, if you're not clashing, um, why are we debating? You know, that, that's, that's a simple question. Um, but I think of debate as being, as consisting of arguments. Um, and it's, it's just the affirmative team making arguments, the negative team making arguments, counter arguments and so on. And when I talk about, when I think about arguments, I think a good argument I, in my mind has a three prong structure. Um, and the three prong structure would be the, the claim, the, the position that you're taking or the claim. Um, but unfortunately we, we, we call a lot of things that are just claims arguments. Just because I've made that claim does not mean it's an argument. Um, it, it's just a claim and it could very well be my opinion. Um, just, just an opinion. But in order to really make sense of it and turn it into an argument, you want to provide warrants to support that claim. Um, and, and that's where we, we bring in evidence. It could be a logical um, argument to, to support your, your claim and so on. So that's the second rung of that. And, and then finally, I think um, this is a part, another part that I think a lot of our debaters miss is you're, you're almost home, but you're not home yet. To bring it home, to, to be persuasive, to persuade your judges, impact it impact and answer the question. So I made this claim and here is my support or warrants for it. So why does it matter? How, how does it impact this, this round and this argument? Um, and so together, I think um, pulling those three elements together makes for some uh, excellent um, arguments and, and you really kind of create, uh, I, you know, I, I have a saying, um, I'm just like, well, debate is all about arguments. It, it's about, you know, uh, again, uh, it, it consists of the smaller elements called arguments uh, and you put them all together and that, that's kind of your debate um, debate round. Yeah, just to add something quickly to what yeah. you were saying about yeah. impact, I think of that as um, kind of two simultaneous levels um, that debaters need to show the impact of their argument on the debate round itself mm -hmm. Like, how is it related to the big picture of affirming the resolution or mm -hmm. negating the resolution? It needs right. to be related to that. But yep. also, what's the human impact? Why should the judge care about what you're yeah. saying? So yeah. kind of relate it to the resolution and how it impacts the overall debate, but also yeah. relate it to a reason to care as a human being. <laughs> yeah, that's great. That's, yeah. Very good.
Yeah. yeah. I think we're, um, when you were talking earlier about integrity and mm. how everything we need to do, everything that's done in the debate round should be done yeah. with integrity to honor the Lord. Um, mm. Can you talk about some practical applications of that in the debate sure. round? Yeah, absolutely. So, I, I mean, there are lots of, I think that this plays out in a lot of different ways. Um, and, we, you know, we don't have time. Um, we'll, we'll cover a few of these things that, that, that comes up, I think. And um, so the way I think about it is how does it come out practically and run? Um, I think being fair, being fair is an important principle of how it practically comes out. And how do you, how, how are you fair in a round? Um, for one, uh, in, in the way you define terms, in the way, you, you know, um, don't define or don't use definitions to unfairly restrict your opponent's ground. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so that, that's, a, I, to me, that's a very important principle. And, um, and you kind of, I think one of the, you know, the practical applications are, are great, but I always think it's very important to make the determination before any of this happens to, to make that determination that you are going to debate with integrity, that you are going to be fair to your opponent. You are going to be respectful um, to your opponents, uh, th those kind of things. Um, another way I think that, um, that it comes out is, um, you know, what's commonly referred to as the 2AR abuse. Uh, where, you know, it, it's the last speech of the round um, and you bring up some new arguments that were not talked about at all the rest of the round. And uh, in certain cases, your opponent has no, it, they don't even have another speech to come address it, even if they wanted to. Um, and so, you know, the, the debate round is sort of broken down into two groupings for a reason. I mean, we have the constructive speeches and then we have the rebuttal speeches. And the whole notion of the constructive speeches is to construct your case, which uh, as we referred to earlier, means arguments. So what, but you're constructing your case by building arguments, constructing arguments. And so by definition, you shouldn't be bringing up new arguments in your rebuttals. You should be rebutting or refuting the arguments that were presented on both sides um, uh, in, in, the, in the constructives. And so I, I think that's another, you know, make determine in your heart way before any stepping onto a round, you know, I, I will not bring up new arguments in the, in the, in the rebuttal speeches, um, especially in the, in the 2AR. Um, so, uh, or, or 2NR in this case. Um, and then finally, I think um, a big part is handling um, evidence with integrity. Uh, I think of that as another major aspect of, of um, or, or a practical application of how this works out in the, in the debate round. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, that is something I think that um, gets a lot of attention in debate, how evidence is used. Mm -hmm. um, we'll hear debaters complaining about the way their opponent handled evidence. Can you talk a little bit in more detail mm -hmm. about how to handle evidence with integrity? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so uh, these are a few sort of different um, ideas related to evidence. I'm gonna present those and then um, I, I actually have a couple of um, examples that, that, I wanna, that I wanna bring up and, and share, uh, maybe make it a little more concrete. Um, so, a couple of uh, sort of ideas related to evidence, um, misconceptions maybe, is um, it's important to understand that evidence itself, just evidence, is not an argument. Um, evidence is not, you know, is not the argument itself, but it provides support or warrant to the argument or the claim that you're making in, in, as part of your um, argument. So. Um, I, I know you've seen this, I've seen this a lot, and I think it'll be great if um, our debaters uh, kind of understand this and, and um, not just read a piece of evidence and just sit down. Right. Uh, because again, it's not, it's not an argument. You, you need to 
make a claim, use the evidence to support that claim, uh, and then impact it. Like you said, I love the, the two-layer impact. Um, you know, how does it impact this round? How does it impact from a human uh, perspective um, at, at that level? Um, and so, and also I think sort of tied to that is this notion that uh, team policy is all about just throwing evidence at, at, at the round. You know, the more the merrier, just the, the more number of, I cite um, 10 pieces of evidence and you, you just cited eight. So, you know, I'm, I'm a stronger debater. That, that's not really true it, because the evidence is not the argument, right? Um, so you need to use logic in making those connections, um, tying the evidence to the argument, to the claim, um, and potentially using it to support multiple arguments, uh, and then tying those together to make a stronger point um, that might have like two sub arguments, whatever, um, and you know, those kind of things. So I, I think um, uh, we need, we definitely need logic in team policy debate. It's, it's an important component. It's an important compo component of making an argument, which is what we said debate is about. And so it's, it's a non-negotiable kind of uh, idea. And then you use evidence to, to support those arguments. Um, another thing um, that I want to sort of touch upon, a uh, common misconception is uh, there's a difference between debate rules and sort of debate theories, for lack of a better word. Um, and so a rule is something that is written down in the official NCFCA tournament document, the rules document. Um, and a theory, a debate theory, is discussed in, in textbooks among experts, coaches, um, and, and so on. And that is basically, I think to, a, a good way to think about those is they are all debatable. And since you're debating, guess what? Go ahead and debate them. Yeah. Um, you know, if, if it's not a rule, then don't assume that, um, that a rule was broken or something. And that's not something you would take to um, adjudication step. But if a rule, a specific rule that's in the rule document was violated, that's something you do want to take to the adjudication team. And that will be researched and, and uh, adjudicated by the national adjudication team. Mm -hmm. um, one, one additional thought there is, even if a rule is broken, um, I think you, you'll agree with me here. Um, we want, we would advise the debaters not to argue about the rules in the round. Um, or, um, worst case scenario, accuse your opponents of misrepresenting evidence in the round. Um, if you believe the interpretation is not right, you should, you should bring that up. Uh, tell the judge why you think the interpretation is not right. Um, but please do not imply an ethics issue just right off the bat. Um, so if you do, unfortunately, you are questioning or challenging their character um, and possibly assigning intent where there may not be any um, intent. So, so be careful with that. And I think it's a, uh, I, I like the way I think I, I'm going to borrow this from you from last week um, or maybe in one of our talks, we, we've, we've had lots of talks, um, <laughs> is I think ultimately that is actually more persuasive to do it this way, to approach it this way to the judge. Um, you know, explain why you don't agree with the interpretation of your opponents um, or explain why it may not be logical, that, that it's in, illogical. Um, and because a logical argument, well-presented logical argument is ultimately persuasive. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what's really important. Now, if you feel like there has been a rule violation after the round, certainly you should be able to take that to the adjudication um, staff, the, the tournament staff, um, and they'll take care of it there. So yeah, and I was, just, I was just gonna add, yeah, as yeah. having been on the national adjudication team, 
Um, it's really important that you argue mishandling of evidence mm. in the round in front of the judge using mm. your substantive arguments. Bring up the evidence, um, show the misinterpretation, you know, bring yeah. all those facts into the round because yeah. that's the only place where the debate happened. The yeah. national adjudication team is not in the round. Right. The judge is in the round. So yep. the judge can decide what actually happened in the round. Mm -hmm. um, so if you hear evidence being misused and then you never say anything about it in the round, yeah. the national tournament staff has no way of knowing what yep. actually happened in the round, but the judge does. So mm -hmm. argue it in front of the judge. Don't just wait and come to compliance later. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so a couple of other things in terms of handling evidence. Um, I think it's very important when you're uh, citing folks to give credit where it's due. Um, the whole idea of building knowledge and writing journal articles and how we develop knowledge is based on this idea that we're all sort of standing on the shoulders of others that have gone before us. Um, they've, they've done some thinking, they've created some ideas. And, um, and so when you're, when you're citing them or using their ideas, it is only right that you give them credit for those ideas that, that, you, that you got from them. Um, and so I think there are a couple of things uh, tied to that directly. One is when you're citing others, please delineate your words and the words of others very, very clearly and distinctly. Um, because you have to you have to sort of put yourself in the shoe of the of the listener if you're not clearly and and distinctly delineating your words from others words that you're quoting or citing they have no way of telling which of those words were yours and which of those words were from the experts um, the easiest way to do the delineation is simply to say I'm gonna you know cite the source so um, quote, and then cite the, the person or, or piece of evidence, and then end quote. That clearly lets the judges know and your opponents know, okay, the, the words that you got from somewhere else are done. So uh, obviously the words that follow are your own. And so that is very important. That's very important for integrity in, in debating and, and in, in citing. Um, uh, I just want to highlight very quickly that there, um, the um, rules um, that we published on the NCFC website uh, has has the rules and um, like for example how to verbally uh, cite evidence is in there. Um, you need to follow that and and um, and use that. Um, so so different there are, again we're not going to cover all of them these are a few of the ways i think that um that we can um sort of get away from debating and citing evidence with with integrity is um distorting evidence right um and that happens via the cutting and tagging of evidence it can happen in in those way um uh, the basic idea is you cannot and should not use or, or misrepresent the view of a, of a source, of an author or something um, by taking either taking sentences out of context or, um, you know, power tagging, making claims that, that the authors never made or it isn't in the article and so on just to support your position, right? So what I want to do uh, is, is sh show, uh, uh, the, when I saw this, this, this absolutely blew my mind, but uh, it, because it's, it's one of those, uh, this kind of um, distortion happening at some very high levels. Uh, but the principle is the same, and I think this illustrates the principle really well. So I'm going to try and share, I have this in a PowerPoint slide so everybody can read it. I'm going to share this. Um, all right, so I hope you can, can you see that okay, Christy? Yes. Okay, great. So this was uh, very interesting. 
Uh, some of you may be familiar with um, the Masterpiece Cake Shop case that went before the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court ruled in favor of the um, cake shop baker, Jack Phillips, seven to two. Um, and the ruling was that the Civil Rights Commission had displayed um, impermissible bias towards his faith. So it was in favor of Jack Phillips and against the Civil Rights Commission. And in their ruling, this is what they wrote. Uh, that's the quote under the, on the, in the first column. While it is unexceptional that Colorado law can protect gay persons in acquiring product, products and services on the same terms and conditions as are offered to other members of the public, the law must be applied in a manner that is neutral towards religion. Okay, fast forward. Um, pretty much uh, very soon after this ruling came out, the same Civil Rights Commission filed a new complaint against the same Jack Phillips, taking a different track, right? And in their complaint, they actually cited the Supreme Court ruling. And the, but what they cited was what's shown in the second column. It is unexceptional that Colorado law can protect gay persons in acquiring products and services on the same terms and conditions as are offered to other members of the public. So just for our benefit, I underlined on the left column the words that they left out. The word while was left out at the beginning of this ruling sentence, and the law must be applied in a manner that's neutral towards religion was left out. All that's I can say is wow. Yeah, that's shocking. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely shocking. But I think it, it's a, to me, it's a really, unfortunately, I want to use the word good. It's not good, but it's a good example mm -hmm. of how um, misuse of evidence, misrepresentation, misrepresentation or misquoting evidence actually happens in the real world. Yes. And so I think it's very, very important for us as we're learning to debate with integrity as unto the Lord, to stay away from this, this kind of idea. Because mm -hmm. you literally, they, they held out some words that turned the decision, the meaning of the sentence upside down. Yes. Simply because they wanted to use it to support their side. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so that, that's not, that's not acceptable. Um, so um, coming back, um, I, I, I think that those are, th those are some, some examples as well. Um, actually, sorry, I have another one that you know, I, I'm going to share again. Um, another example. All right, so here's a scenario where you know, you can. Uh, I'll pause a, a second here, so that so you can read that. So looking at, at quote A, students who think they'll make a lot of money after college may not want to consider the ISA. ISA stands for Income Share Agreements. Um, may not want to consider the ISAs either. ISAs require students to pay a fixed percentage of their income, so they can be an expensive proposition for students who do really well, even if the terms are better than for other majors. Now, these are some things that you cannot and should not do with this, right? So you may be tempted to read the first quote and tag it as ISAs are a terrible idea. The problem is the, the first quote says nothing of that sort, right? That's an extreme uh, power tagging applied to 
uh, all ISAs, they're, they're all terrible ideas. But here's the other thing is from the same article, we get quote B, which sort of actually says, well, ISAs make sense in certain situations for these groups of students. And so again, it doesn't fit that power tag of it's terrible in all cases. Um, so, but if you're only cutting quote A and putting it in your, um, in your brief or your, whatever you're citing, your card, um, and, and power tagging, the power tagging is a, is a problem just literally from that, those two sentences, they don't say that. Um, but also, your opponents and the judge doesn't know that later on in the article, the authors are talking about certain situations where it actually makes sense um, for, for, for you to consider ISS. And so these, these are ethical violations. If you, if you do either of those kind of situations, um, that's not a good idea. Um, so what can the students make? Or, or, or you might say, well, you know, the professor, whatever, whoever wrote this article um, claims that um, ISAs are terrible. Um, you're attributing a, an idea or a statement or a claim to the source that they never make, that they never intended to be made. And so you, you need to be very careful to stay true to the intent of the entire article, of the, of the whole, um, the intent of the, of the authors of the article. Here's another case that I've seen um, a, a lot of, and some of these things I do know is because um, students may not know that this is how it, it, it works, um, is uh, I, I, I'm a professor, I do research, I submit journal articles. Well, all the journal articles that I write, uh, pretty much uh, all the journals require that I have a section there called limitations. The idea being none of the research that we do is completely perfect and it's, everything is great and it applies universally and all of that stuff. So typically we talk about, well, you know, this, the, you, you should take the conclusions as it applies to this particular group. Or, um, you know, there are some other limitations in this study. Well, you can't and should not take a sentence or two from the limitation section and say, the article itself is saying that these are the, these are the conclusions that the authors came up with. That is not true. They, it, and it, just because an article has limitations does not mean that the conclusions are not necessarily legitimate. Yeah, that, I've seen that. I've seen that many yeah. times, Robbie. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So um, yeah. So that, that that's another example. And feel free to add there. Um, share your thoughts there, Christy. I think the examples you gave are exactly the ones we need to share because, unfortunately, I do see this um, judging debate myself and also adjudicating mm -hmm. um, appliance issues. I've seen all of those things that you've talked about. And yeah. like you said. If we can't judge the heart. Some of those things yep. are sometimes done on accident. Yeah. Uh, but I know firsthand, having been a debater myself, the temptation. Yeah. Yeah. When you're reading an article and you find this little nugget, and you're like, yeah. oh, that would be great <laughs> if the author actually makes the opposite conclusion. Yes. 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 You just want to pull that little bit out and use it, and you you can't. You can't do that in good conscience before the Lord. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and usually um, the interesting thing is those sentences always sort of start off with having said that <laughs> or things like that. And, and, you know, make sure if you are citing that, that sentence or that paragraph, make sure you're including the having said that. You know, that's the equivalent of this um, Supreme Court misuse of evidence there that, that right. I showed as an example. That's good. That's good. Um, well, Moving on to kind of wrap up, um, yeah. what are some of the big end goal ideas with policy debate? Okay, um, I'll share some and, and um, maybe you can add some to that, uh, Christy. I, th I think that's a great question and I think really 
I'm a big fan of starting with the goal in mind, you know, with, with the end in mind kind of thing. And these are, I think, um, some excellent things to keep in mind as you start and continue and, and debate and so on. Um, one is to think through your case carefully and condense it down to one or two key ideas, arguments, points. Um, Another way to think of that is I tell my kids is what you must win to win the round. What one or two arguments? It's it's not. I mean, you you'll hit a lot of arguments, some pseudo arguments, some partial arguments, and so on during the whole round. But it comes down to what one or two arguments are you going to hang your hat on, and you know that if you win those two arguments, um, you have a good chance of winning the round. Um, and, and make sure that those are linked to um, every, everything that you're talking about should be linked to those points. It should keep coming back to those points, right? And that's how you sort of build on that. And, um, and it's something that the judges take back with them when they're filling out ballots. It, it stands out. It's clear. It's like, okay, uh, if I'm going to vote for this team, it's because they convinced me of these two points, uh, whatever those two points are. And, and, uh, I think you and I will appreciate this as judges. Please do that for us. It's helpful, um, you know, when we go back there. Um, and, and I think it's a really good strategy to do that. Um, another point I think is be reasonable when you're debating. Um, you know, don't be afraid to concede a point. Yes. Um, you know, especially, I mean, please don't do that if that's one of your two big arguments that you must win, but, but there are lots of other smaller arguments that, that you'll get in the round. Um, it's okay to concede. It's okay to agree with a point with your opponent um, because you, you, are, you come across as being reasonable, someone that, you know, I want to uh, hear, I want to understand where you're coming from, and um, that, that's a good thing um, to do that. Um, don't, don't quibble over ground that's, um, that's, that's mutual. Um, I, I think sometimes, I, I don't know, debaters must get some wrong, I don't know where they get, I mean, I've literally been in a round where, you know, the, in cross X, um, this debater was asked, uh, are trees a part of the environment? And I, and I'm not making this up. He would not give up that ground. He's like, well, it depends on, I'm like, no, you know, Just say yes. it doesn't Just depend. Say yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's not going to result in a loss for you if you, if you agree with your opponent on that point. Right. So um, another thing that I think key, a key to making persuasive arguments is uh, our warrant. Support, support your argument and impact them. Support your argument and impact them. Um, another key, I think, is to, um, as you grow as a, as a debater and, and um, move move into um, better levels of debating, uh, work on your rhetoric to sort of articulate those key points simply and clearly in conversational language, yes. uh, right? We stress that in NCFCA a lot. Um, uh, I, I stress that with my student. I, I don't know, I think maybe it's a human thing. We like, we, we want to use big words for some reason. Um, and I, I think it actually is counterproductive in a lot of instances. Of course, there are places where, you know, it's the one word that accurately uh, articulates what you're trying to say, and that's fine. But for the most part, keep it simple. Keep the language simple, clear, easy to understand, conversational. Um, avoid jargon. You know, don't, don't. If you can say, um, judges, these, um, the, our plan is going to help solve the problem and result in these ad advantages, do that. Uh, you know, you don't have to say insolvency point one point A, whatever, you know, just you, you don't need to. It's good that you understand the framework and those terms, um, team policy terms, but uh, try not to use those. Or even content specific jargon. Um, every area has its own specific jargon. So avoid just throwing out words and um, assuming that your judges and your opponents know what that means. Um, it, that's not very helpful. Um, another point, we've touched on this before, impact, impact, impact. Always show why does it matter, so what? 
um, bring, bring it home. Um, and finally, I'd say, um, remember and that your ultimate responsibility in the round, in an NCFCA debate round, is actually to persuade your judges and not your opponents. That's an interesting thought that, that's worth consideration. And, and I think that might help you change the way you debate as well. So that's, that's what I have. That's good. I think the only thing I would add is to say, on affirmative, don't forget the advantages of your plan. Don't let the negative team bog you down and all these mm -hmm. details. It's similar to what you're saying, like the one or two yeah. points that you need to win. Yeah. Remember your complete case and why it's amazing. Don't yeah. let the negative pull you off that. And for negative, I would say, don't forget that the affirmative team has the burden of proof and that you can question things that they've said. And yeah. if you haven't supported arguments with evidence, you can point that out without having counter evidence in you know if you're not prepared you you this is a surprise case yeah um, you can still question the logic behind those arguments whether or yeah. not they are warranted whether they've yeah. been supported well whether they've been impacted and just raising those questions can sometimes be enough to yeah. show that the affirmative hasn't met their burden of proof yeah yeah that's great all right, great. Well, thank you, Robbie. This is fantastic. I think thank you've you. given us a lot of um, a lot of food for thought, a lot of great information. Mm -hmm. I think we're going to um, send it back to Natalia and then okay. we'll take uh, the questions okay. that we've been receiving. Yeah, great. Okay, great. Sounds great. All right. Thank you, Robbie and Christy. And I know we'll be jumping right back in with some great questions that students have submitted. Um, students, coaches, and parents, I should say. We have a lot of uh, variety here in our audience, which is great to see. So our giveaway winners for this evening, thank you for submitting very thoughtful, helpful questions for this evening. Our winners are Nicole Arsenault and Jay Mosby. So Nicole Arsenault and Jay Mosby, if you could drop your email address into the chat section, that will go just directly to us on the back end. We'll make sure that you get your NCFCA hoodie. If you could also let us know what your preferred size for that hoodie would be, that would be great. Mm -hmm. So congratulations to our winners. Thank you for your questions. And just a couple of brief announcements about the final NCFCA webinars for this 2018-2019 um, season. This Thursday, November 15th at 6 p.m. Central, we have an interpretation webinar with Heather Newman and Christy Eskelin. So join in as we dive into interpretation, blocking and characterization, if you're planning on putting an interp together this year or coaching that in club. And then our final webinar will be December 3rd at 6 p.m. Central. That will be an apologetics webinar with the executive director of Worldview Academy. Um, he's gonna select some of the topics from NCFCA's apologetic topic list and provide some educational context that we hope will be helpful to you as you prepare your cards and jump into this competition season. So sign up for those events if you haven't already and we'll see you there. With that, we'll transition back over to our great discussion on team policy. But first, I wanted to give Christy the opportunity to just tell you a little bit about um, the NCFCA Comprehensive Guide to Policy Debate, as she is the author. And I know a lot of the concepts that are being discussed here are addressed in the curriculum, but I'd love for her to tell you a little bit more about what's available in that resource. Thanks, Natalia. Sure. Um, so we have a competitor's handbook, which has, it's organized into 12 lessons, and it takes you through a lot of the material you just heard um, tonight, plus a, a, a lot more in depth um, it has sample cases in there, how to um, cut and tag evidence, how to research, um, audience analysis, which is something that's often overlooked, how to tailor your message to your audience and impact it for your audience like we were talking about. Hmm. And um, so that's done in the student handbook. And then the, what's new from when I originally wrote the book 20 years ago is that there's also a coach's guide. So this has, um, those 12 lessons for the coaches and how to teach it to your students with questions to ask them for discussion, um, with exercises for every lesson that you can do in club or in class 
to help reinforce the concepts and how to pre prepare your teams for competition. Uh, so all of that is done in the coaching manual. And then there's also a parent's guide so that parents can kind of get the right. short and fast version of what their students are learning so that they can be better prepared to help their students um, and better prepared also to judge. So that's what we have available yeah. with that resource. Thank you, Christy. That's very helpful. And I'm just going to jump in for a final reminder because I did see a couple of questions come in that are rule specific. So a reminder that the goal of tonight's webinar is not to unpack those rules or to replace or revise those rules in any way. So if you want help in um, thinking through those rules, you can do that after the webinar by sending your questions directly to Director of Forensics, and the email address for that is dir, for Director, of Forensics at ncfca.org. That's a great way to get your rules questions addressed, but with that, we'll jump back into um, the framework of team policy, and we hope that this sparks some really great discussion for parents, coaches, and students across the country. All right. Thanks, Natalia. Um, we've got a bunch of good questions here, Robbie, so I'm just going to okay, jump great. in. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, the first question is, would it be ethical to respond to arguments introduced in the 2AC in the 1NR that weren't addressed in the 2NC? So, in other words, after the constructive speeches, the second negative constructive did not bring those arguments up. Can mm -hmm. the 1NR respond to them in rebuttals? Okay, um, and you can share uh, your thoughts on this, uh, Christy, but my feeling based on the scenario that you just described is you are responding to arguments that were created in the constructives, mm -hmm. and that is perfectly fine because that's what you're, you, you can do that in the, in the rebuttal speeches, responding to arguments. The, the issue that we were talking about earlier, which is um, what we don't, want you to do is um, is create new arguments in the in the rebuttals um, and so yeah yeah I agree I okay. agree if you're responding to an argument that was made yeah. in constructives yeah. that's appropriate for rebuttals yeah yeah it's good. okay we have a couple of questions yeah. along those lines yeah can, can you bring up new evidence in the 2AR okay Okay, yeah, so I think, um, if I may, I'm gonna go back to what we discussed earlier. And I think understanding, a, a good understanding of the, um, what I call the argument structure, I think will help in this context mm -hmm. to answer this question. So if you, if you remember, I talked about the argument structure being com made up of uh, a claim, a warrant, and an impact. So, evidence and, and we also talked about how evidence itself is not an argument in and of itself so an evidence is provided or a piece of evidence or multiple pieces of evidence to as support for the claim that you're making which is part of the argument and so bringing up a piece of evidence or two or three or whatever in support of an argument that's already been made is not a problem in the rebuttal speeches because evidence is not equal an argument. So you're not bringing up new arguments, you're bringing up evidence to support arguments that have already been made. Great, yes, I completely agree. And that kind of um, brings up another question that we yeah. had come in here. Does lo is logic considered evidence? Yeah, um, and I'm gonna bat that right back to you because okay. I thought you <laughs> answered that last week and I, I, it, was, it was phenomenal. I don't think I could do justice, so. Okay, yeah. sure, yeah. yeah. Yes, the short answer is yes. Logic can be evidence. Yeah. If, if it is something that is self-evident or accepted by most people, um, but also logic forms the framework and structure mm -hmm. of that, those warrants. So logic is always involved in evidence. Like you have to make, as you were saying, Robbie, you have to make a logical connection yourself between yep. the quotation, if you're using that, yeah. Yeah. and the claim that you're making. That's logic. Yeah. That's yeah. using logic as evidence. And yeah. yes, sometimes you can use 
just logic without any quotations if it's something that everybody is very likely to accept. Yes. Yeah. yeah. That's what I would say. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Great. Yeah, we want logic and quotations and experts <laughs> for support. Yeah. yeah. Um, what is your opinion on which types of debate cases to run? For example, like a plan meet need case where it's um, harms plan advantages or a comparative advantages case or maybe another case type. Do you have an opinion on that? Yeah, um, my opinion is I think um, any and all of those forms are, are fine. Um, yeah. It just depends on, on the case itself. I think depends on the, on the plan. Uh, I mean, really everything in team policy comes down to the plan and different plans have um, sort of some defining characteristics that I think lend themselves, some of them lend, be, be, some, some of them lend themselves better to a certain kind of um, a structure, a, a case structure. So I don't, I, I wouldn't say definitely one way or another, or one is wrong or um, it, it, it truly is, uh, yeah. I Whatever agree. makes the most sense. Yeah. I agree. Yes. Yeah. Um, does the affirmative team have to prove all of their harms or just one? <laughs> okay. Um, so I, I think uh, that, that, that is a good question. It's an interesting question. So the idea is for, for to be a persuasive argument uh, and a case and a round, the more you can show that your plan impacts the harms and results in advantages, the more persuasive your case is going to be. Um, and so if you have multiple harms in the status quo, then I would say show them, but show them so that you can show how your plan solves for those multiple harms and results in significant and good solid advantages. Mm -hmm. If you don't know that your plan, if you don't think you can show that direct link, so let's say you have three harms and you feel like, uh, yeah, I can show using logic and evidence and expert opinion and all that, I can show how the plan um, positively impacts two of those harms resulting in advantages, but I really can't make the link between um, the plan and the third harm. I would say no, don't include that third harm because if you do, you're leaving a, a big door for your opponents to say, well, they presented this harm, but look, their plan isn't doing anything so you're kind of inviting uh, an attack on that front mm -hmm. um, that you don't necessarily need. Yeah, that's a good point, yeah. I would say technically, yes, you only have to prove one significant inherent harm mm -hmm. that is solved by your plan. Mm -hmm. You really only need to show one, it has to be significant. <laughs> yeah. But um, as long as you show that one yeah. significant inherent problem has yeah. will be solved and produce advantages, then yes, yeah. you can win that way. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I agree. Um, okay, this is a, more related to the topic this year, but also it's a good illustration just for um, yes. so things that can happen any year. Yep. What if the topic the 1AC presents is domestic terrorism or domestic policy instead of, as the topic says, international terrorism? Okay. Yeah. So um, I'm going to step into the uh, stock issues framework for a second to, to, um, to address that, um, which I think it's, it's a phenomenal framework. I really like the stock issues framework because in my mind, it 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 makes sense um, that that the um, the burden you you know you talked about the affirmative team having the burden um, of, of proof, and an easy way of thinking about it is via the stock issues framework. So um, 
just to lay out the four stock issues, we're talking about topicality, we're talking about significance, we're talking about inherency and solvency, right? And so in layman's terms, all we're, I'll come back to topicality last, although it's probably the first one you should consider. Yeah. Um, uh, inherency simply means that it, you have the burden to show that the problem exists in the status quo. The problem that you're trying to solve exists. Significance deals with just as you said that there is a significant harm in the status quo um, and that your, your advantages are significant as well in, in solving that harm. And then finally solvency deals with solving the harm. Your plan is helping solve some of the harms that you've stated uh, resulting in the advantage. So those, those are sort of big three. Um, topicality which I think is really important, but I know, um, you know, parents, judges sometimes are um, kind of like, oh, no, not another topicality argument. The, the way I look at it, and Christy, please um, add to it, um, the reason for the topicality as a, as, a, uh, uh, as a stock issue is to help create the boundaries for the round, for the year, for the resolution. If we did not have those bounds, if we, it simply would mean that um, you could pick a plan to solve any problem on planet Earth, to do anything, um, and, and you know, as long as you fulfill the other three stock issue um, framework burdens. Um, it, and it may be fun to think of as affirmative, but if you've ever gone neg, <laughs> policy round, um, that's an impossible task, and it's extremely unfair to uh, expect the negative team to be prepared to defend the status quo in any area of, of anything in, in, in the world. And so that's the topicality issue. And so I think it is important as you're looking at cases, and if, if I might add something else, I, I think that it's it's maybe a personal thing, but it's sort of frustrating to me when I see teams pick cases that are almost obviously non-topical. Mm -hmm. And the reason it's frustrating is because, and I think this is, I'm not alone in this, but, but the reason is, I mean, we have plenty of cases that will fall within the topic of the resolution. Right. There are tons of legitimate, very solid topical cases that you can run on U.S. policy towards international terrorism. And so my encouragement to you is, please do some, you know, do some work up front in choosing a case that is obviously topical. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, so in the question, I think if I remember your question, sorry, I have to set up, so I think, if, some background. So if, neg, or, so if you're neg and you're yeah. up against a case that doesn't appear to be topical, how would you argue that? Okay, that's the question. Um, hmm. Hmm. Well, I would, I would argue the round. I would debate that I would still focus on the merits of their plan. I would still look at, is it an inherent problem? Mm -hmm. um, and I would, I think I would zoom in on, because where you're going to really see the difference between a plan that deals with domestic terrorism versus uh, international terrorism mm -hmm. is going to be insolvency mm -hmm. um, and, and in the advantages that result there. And so I would, sort of zoom in in that area and, and do a lot of um, attacking of those areas. Um, you know, and, and by doing that, I would, I think, constantly kind of show how this only results in domestic terrorism. I always sort of tie back to, this is not really impacting international terrorism. This is not really touching international terrorism. Um, and then use that to show to the judge Judge, we, we seem to be talking about domestic terrorism. Uh, we're, we're, you know, we're, we're supposed to be debating international terrorism. Yeah. Um, so that, that would be sort of an approach I would, I would take with that. Yeah, I agree. I think you need to make substantive arguments, not just technical yeah. arguments, but it is yeah. an important argument to say, you gave the yeah. justification for topicality really well, yeah. that it's an unfair burden on the negative yeah. to have to prepare 
for yep. any kind of case under the sun. Yep. And you know, you could say they've made this great argument for domestic terrorism, yep. but they haven't given us a yep. reason to affirm this resolution. Yeah. As foreign policy toward international terrorism, they haven't explained that. They haven't yep. proven that case. They haven't yep. solved that problem. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And, and I think it's important. Unfortunately, like I said, I, I've, I've talked to uh, lots of parents that, that kind of, I think it's because there have been, they've watched too many debate rounds where maybe it wasn't a clear cut, um, you know, delineation between the, it wasn't clear cut, uh, non-topical. Um, and so the majority of the round just comes up, comes out to, yes, it's, Topical? No, it's not topical. Yes, it's not. You know, which which we we don't we don't really enjoy those kind of rounds. But I agree with you. It is important to make that argument. Um, but I think it's also extremely important to the way you word that argument and the way you present that argument that you don't come across as a you know, um, woe is me kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, oh yeah. Like uh, I'm yeah, so burdened. Yeah. And yeah. Um, so but but. but <laughs> right, but but it is it is an important issue, and there is, topicality is an important stock issue, um, and you need to present it, um, but attack with solid um, arguments. Yes, substantive yes, arguments. Substantive. And I I coach affirmatives. Um, wait, okay, wait. I'm gonna. I just lost my point, my thought. But I coach negatives not to um, run topicality if the case is topical. Oh, like absolutely, absolutely. Don't do, don't do it as a matter of course. Yeah. Only do it if you really think it's not topical. Yep. That's what I would yep. say. Yeah. And I, oh, I coach affirmatives um, that they must do what the resolution says yep. and they must not do anything else. Mm -hmm. okay. That's how I tell my affirmative. Yeah. Team. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Because there, there's so much ground to cover. I mean, that's the thing is if you said, Oh, I can't really find a case that, no, that's, that there are lots of good cases. That right, are. exactly. Yeah. Um, so do you think that it's worth kind of along these lines, if fiat power became an issue or if something like a prima facie case became an issue, would you bring those up? Would you um, explain those to the judge? And, and if so, how would you do that? Yeah, wow, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I would absolutely, okay, let's um, break those two down. With, sure. with fiat, um, I would absolutely, actually it applies to both, but um, fiat, I would absolutely address it. Um, and I think you're actually gonna be doing the judges a favor by doing it um, because of what I said when I talked about fiat. Um, one of the reasons we, the affirmative team has the fiat is so that the debate round doesn't come down to, oh, no, no, they won't do it because of this. They won't do it because of that political stuff, all of that, which really isn't the point of the debate round. And so, uh, again, the key, though, is I think when you're making that argument to um, um, your, your rhetoric is, is important in, in how you present it. I would clearly explain the, the, what fiat is and you know why fiat is um, is a thing in team policy debate, um, and then then present the argument that um, some of the arguments that the other team is making are related to fiat, and we don't really we shouldn't be addressing those. Uh, you'd rather you know talk about substantive arguments on the content of the case. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think I would say something like, um, we assume that for the sake of the debate, the affirmative team has the, the power to affirm the resolution. Yep. But yep. these elements of the case are actually fall outside of the boundaries of the resolution. Yep. And therefore, the theory of fiat power would hold that they don't have the power yep. to do yep. something that falls outside of the resolution. And then show what those things are and why those elements don't actually affirm the resolution. Yeah. Yeah. And if I may, um, Christy, this might be also a good point because you actually used the word, uh, you said, you said debate theory would show. 
Uh, again, another, um, I think it's a good point to reiterate what we said earlier. Mm -hmm. This is not a rule violation. So if someone brings up something that talks about fiat, um, you know, it's not something you're going to take to adjudication, but it is something that you should debate in round. Yes. Um, but, you know, create those good um, wording structure to explain what fiat is, why it's important and um, why what they're talking about falls under that and therefore um, doesn't apply. Yes, right. Big picture, you're just using logic. You're using logical yes. reasons that would persuade yeah. the average person. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Good. Um, oh, we got a lot more questions in here. <laughs> um, let me ask this. I'm going to get off theory a little bit. Okay. Different regions debate different ways. How do you prepare for an open tournament where you'll meet all the different styles? Okay. Um, I'm not sure I understand the meaning of how they're using the term different styles in different mm -hmm. regions. Yeah. So I'm not sure I, I, I know how to answer that. Okay. All right. I would, um, I think that logic is the foundation of debate so <laughs> yeah stick, right. with that. stick with that there might be some little customs but you can't you yeah can't anticipate that and just sure. um you know yeah. stick to your integrity and your logic yeah. and do that yeah. yeah um let me see how much can natalia can you tell me how much time we have <laughs> <laughs> good question so we had advertised 45 minutes for the lecture and 45 minutes for Q&A. Okay, so we've got about six more minutes, I guess. Is that right? Yes. Yep. Okay. Okay. Um, here's a question. What is the best way to impact arguments? It's kind of hard to answer, but mm. maybe talking a little bit more about that. It, it doesn't have to be long. I would say it can yep. be one or two sentences. Yeah. But I think it needs to answer the question, why are you making this argument in the first place? Right. 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 <laughs> and explain that up front. Don't just explain it at the end. But then explain how this argument has anything to do with affirming or negating the resolution. Right. Why the judge should care. I don't know how else to say it than yeah, that. Yeah, so so I'm thinking um there was a um I think it was an ADS last year, um, and, and the topic, and I'm going to use that as the claim, the, the topic of the ADS, okay. and it was um, that birds don't exist. Okay. Okay. So, <laughs> so there's the claim, birds don't exist, um, and in order to support that claim, you might uh, pull out some evidence, right? Um, that birds were all exterminated. And, um, and here's a piece of evidence that cites the date and time and place where all birds on planet Earth were exterminated. Therefore, uh, birds don't exist. So, but if you leave it at that, um, you're not addressing the impact, right? So you need to take that one step further and say, so what? Because this birds don't exist, what, what is the, what, what is, what is the impact of you showing that birds don't exist, which is your claim, right? That's really what we're talking about with the, with the, with the impact. Um, and, and I think, as you said, a lot of times the most powerful things are, um, let's say, just for example, I know um, like drone strikes are a big um, topic, right? And this, this year's resolution. Uh, well, okay, so you said drone strikes um, should be canceled. Let's say that's your claim, your argument, um, and you should have some evidence to show why, um, you know, the, this drone, particular drone, drone strike in Pakistan killed 300 um, innocent folks. If you left it there, you didn't impact it. You'd left the, one of the most important, most persuasive things that you could do, which is by saying, so what is the impact of this is we are not responsibly using drone strikes. And so instead of attacking and taking down terrorists, who is our targets, we're taking innocent civilian life. Hmm. 
and that's that's an impact that is persuasive that that you know will judges will sit up and take notice and this is an important impact so that's that's kind of what we're talking about those kind those kind of making those yeah that's a really good example um let me ask you a couple questions about yeah. research uh we got a question about the best sources to use Ooh. she uh, or he i don't know oh it's okay. a she, she yeah. said she mentioned the heritage institute cato the new york times like what's a good source Oh boy, yeah. Um, we don't have a lot of time, but there's obviously, um, that's a great question, by the way. And um, there's a, there's sort of a hierarchy of the built-in credibility of sources. Mm -hmm. um, so um, along those is, I would say for the most part, um, journal articles are some, some of the top most credible uh, sources. Mm -hmm. Now, what's really hard uh, is understanding that even within journal articles, there's a hierarchy of the kinds of journals uh, and their built-in credibility that you can use um, in round. It, you obviously don't know that, but I think one of the big reasons for journal articles in general um, that are very good, credible sources is because most of them go through some rigorous peer review. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the reason that builds in that credibility is, a lot, uh, um, for example, I, I had an article that went through three review cycles and it took five years for the article to get published. Right. You know, I mean, literally every word in every sentence was marked in red when, when you know, why did you say that? Who says this? Where did you get it from? Can you show, you know, the same things we're talking about here is done in a very, very minute scale with some of those articles. And so, again, doesn't necessarily mean they're all perfect, but it does have a higher level of credibility. Um, I think in the team policy world, uh, if you find any kind of meta studies, so meta study is something that looks at combines a lot of studies in, in one and draws conclusions based on a look at that. Uh, those are very strong, uh, if you can find those in support of your, um, your argument or, or claim that you're making. Um, um, and then it sort of comes down, um, news articles, news sources. Um, I, I think you all know what's going on with those. I mean, it's just unfortunate, but we, we seem to be losing uh, trust very, very quickly in most of those, um, just because most of those are not, they don't seem to be vetted, they don't seem to, you know, have things that, that we can trust. And so those, in my opinion, are, are, they were lower and they seem to be dropping lower and lower in, in terms of credibility, something that I can just look at and say, okay, yeah, I, I, I trust this. Um, now, that's not across the, across the board. Um, there are definitely some, and um, so, and then websites, I mean, I, I, you know, websites really don't have any credibility um, per se, just, just directly. Um, right. So you want to kind of be careful in terms of using those. Um, and things like blogs, um, emails, personal things, really, ha in my opinion, have no credibility, um, unfortunately, because they can't be, um, they, they're not vetted for one, and you can't even publicly confirm that this is something that this person who said, you know, said this. Um, and if you're going to try and tie in the credibility to the source, I mean, it may be a really good source that authored it, but we don't know if that's, you know, and, and in the whole scheme of things. So uh, I think another important point that, that was made is um, kind of think about uh, consistency. You, you also, when you're looking at sources and evidence, you want to find consistency. You, if you find one that's just way off on left field, um, I, would, I would question the credibility of that source, um, even if it's in a journal article, or whatever. It, it just um, is not very strong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. And I think um, think tanks can think tanks are good, yeah. good sources as well. Yeah. Uh, you, yeah. do, you do kind of want to know the background of the think tank yes. and it yeah. all depends on how well respected the source is i think too yeah um, yeah 
I like to use a source that's well respected amongst many different kinds of people yeah. and yes. has been well vetted. I Very think good. those two things. Yeah, and I, and I think if I might just, um, I agree with you. Uh, it's a, if you're doing think tanks and that kind of stuff, make sure you understand where they're coming from, their their ideology, where their positioning is, um, and and be upfront with it, and and you know know that that's that's where they're coming from, and so um, yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Well, I think that's our our time limit here. Okay. So yeah. I will. Um, thank you so much for all of your time that you've taken yeah. tonight. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Christy. Yeah, you're welcome. It was, it was fun. Great. All right. Yes, thank you, Robbie and Christy. Um, and to all who joined us this evening, definitely spread the word. Um, those who are attendees tonight, spread the word to your friends and other NCFCA families, um, because we really do want this to be the beginning of an ongoing conversation. So as we mentioned in the introduction and the halfway point, the goal here was not to revise NCFCA rules or add to them in any way, but just to have a continuing conversation between NCFCA parents, coaches, students about the, um, the framework for policy debate. So with that, thank you for joining us this evening. This recording will be available so that you can share it with your friends and family. And I did just want to mention briefly, there were a few questions that weren't specifically addressed in tonight's webinar that I think Ravi and Christy actually gave excellent answers to in the Lincoln Douglas um, webinar that re we recorded last Monday. So some questions about the Bible, how to integrate that in debate rounds, what are different perspectives on that topic. Um, I think the answers that you'll find in the LD recording could be applicable to both um, value debate and policy debate. So I put that link in the Q&A session. I'll make sure to provide that link in the email that goes out tomorrow with tonight's recording. Um, just an encouragement, if you visit that recording on YouTube, um, there's actually a nice outline of the timetable for every topic that was covered in that webinar because it was pretty long. So you can actually click by topic it's all linked. If you click, it'll take you directly to the answer that you're looking for. So brief note about how to utilize the recordings after. Um, thanks for joining us tonight, and we hope you have a wonderful evening, um, and we look forward to a great competition season. Thank you. So, Good night. Bye. Good night.